Yeah, you know, obviously this is our first week of team practice. We've had uh, a few weeks now of individual group workouts and uh, getting guys ready for this period. Uh, but now it's team practice and we get to inner squad and uh, see what these guys look like in games competing. So anxious for it. And uh, we'll start Thursday and Friday to be our first two inner squad games. Uh, the public, media, everybody's more than welcome to come watch us play. Uh, total all access. And if you want to come watch the new Gamecocks or the return of Gamecocks, you're more than welcome to come out starting Thursday uh, for inner squad. So with that, I'll be happy to answer questions. Great fan, we got Mike here. Let's start on your right, David. David, of course. Or, you know. Mark, uh, if you could just, uh, are there any guys you know won't be around in the fall, maybe through the season with injuries? Uh, Jersey Beck most likely will not pitch this year. Uh, Reese Markham, a freshman, most likely will not pitch this year. Uh, he had uh, Tommy John uh, during his uh, high school career. Um, and then for the fall, you're looking at pitchers that probably will not pitch this fall. Uh, Kimball, Polk, Williams. I suspect this to be one of your questions, so I tried to write it down. I think I'm including most of the guys. Uh, Beach, McCoy, uh, those guys will most likely not pitch uh, this fall. Um, obviously, things can change, but we're going to be conservative with those pitchers uh, to make sure they're ready for the spring. Also, Mark, a year ago uh, today, or, or this time last year, we're coming in saying they're, they're set with pitching, but the hitting's got to come. Right. This year's kind of seems to be the opposite. Right. So how do you feel about your offense? And then really, what do you need to see from your pitchers to develop uh, this fall? Yeah, well, that turned out pretty well last year. Didn't it? So we're hoping it's history repeating itself, just the reverse side. Um, yeah, I think our hitters are, I think our offense, most, most people will look at us and say, damn, we've got a chance to be pretty good because we return most of that offense. We've added some really good players, both in the freshman class, uh, but in the transfer portal. Uh, so I think pitching-wise, we're going to need guys to step up. We're going to need returners to improve um, and take on bigger roles, just like guys did last year. Hicks's role last year was much bigger than it had been in the past. Same with Jack Mahoney and, and on and on. Uh, so I think we have the arms. I think we have the, the talent. We have the depth from a pitching standpoint uh, to get the job done. It's just a matter of now uh, which guys make the most progress Matt Williams, our pitching coach, uh, and who, who takes the reins and gets the biggest role. So uh, Thursday's day one of that process. So there's a long way to go to figure that part out. Mark Collin. Mark Collin. Welcome. How are you Thank you. Um, you bring in Matt Williams, mentioned him, and, and Joey Holcomb. Just what led you to bring those two guys into this program, and how have you seen them kind of interact with the staff and the players so far? Uh, very good. It's been a very seamless transition. Uh, they were both brought here because they are proven talent developers uh, at the very highest level. Uh, both of them, uh, they both had tremendous success. Uh, I liked Matt Williams' success not only in college and having some of the best staffs in the country, but also his experience with the San Diego Padres. And uh, Joey uh, is known as one of the best hitting developers in the country. So him combined with Monty, I thought could really be a great combination. So uh, their transition here has been very, very smooth. Back to your right, John. You lost some really key piece last year, Braylon. Um, doesn't look like you brought in a, a shortstop from the portal. Um, you got your freshman Lee and, and Will Tippett coming back. What have you seen out, out of those two guys, and what gave you confidence to, to not go into the portal and, and try to find a more experienced guy? Yeah, well, we have we have two guys that I think are plenty talented enough to, to do it, uh, especially defensively in Tippett and Ellis. Um, you're probably looking at, now there's a couple other guys we can look at for depth behind them, but you're looking at those two guys will be fighting it out for, for innings at shortstop. Uh, I think they both need to continue to improve and get stronger and, and get more offensive. But defensively, I feel really good that we'll get the kind of defense we need out at shortstop. Uh, they're both extremely athletic. They're both 6'5 runners. Uh, Lee is extremely athletic and, and really Tippett is too. So I think we'll get the kind of defense we want out there at shortstop from those guys. And it's just a matter of how much uh, do they continue to improve offensively. But we're, we're in good shape there. Senator Cohn. Uh, your two big offensive additions to the portal, Kennedy, Austin, what do you like about those two guys and where do you see them kind of fitting in now at this point, even though it's early? Well, I, I think obviously they were brought here because they were proven. And that's the difference you get these days with the transfer portal is you get guys that have proven numbers. And the two guys you mentioned are both going to be right there in the mix uh, for, for playing time and impact. Um, but I'll look at Parker Nolan and I'll look at Blake Jackson as two more portal offensive guys, uh, among others, that I think will really have a chance to help us. So, uh, again, most of our offense is back, but there are a couple spots. Um, 
and that we will need to replace. And it may be you replace a former player like Braylon Wimmer, but it, there's also going to be competition for bats and innings in the outfield, you know, even with, with returning starters. Uh, that's, that's the beauty of this roster right now. There's a lot of talent, there's a lot of depth, there's a lot of experience. And so uh, as a coach, you just kind of sit back now, continue to help them develop, and then let guys earn jobs. I know you're probably still working on the schedule, but at least the three non-con series at other than Clemson. Uh, can you give us any updates on those? Uh, they are they are in place. I don't believe the contracts have been signed yet, so that's obviously that's usually the last piece of the puzzle for when you release it. Um, but those will be released really sooner rather than later. We're obviously bringing a lot of freshman pitchers that are going to have to probably. For any, what do you like about your, your freshman arms that you brought in with this 23 class and, and how big of a role will they have this year? Yeah, they, their role will be determined by how well they do both this fall and, and into the spring, uh, both in the preseason but also once they get opportunities in games. Um, we've got, you know, the, the pitching is going to be very similar, like was asked earlier um, by David. Um, last year we had no idea how we're going to score runs, who's going to start, where we're going to get our power. All those things, and I think you look at the pitching now um, in the same way, but last year we had some returning players get significantly better, like a, like a Messina. You had some portal guys come in um, and have significant contributions, and we had some other guys just continue to evolve. And I think pitching will be the exact same way. So the freshmen, there are some very talented freshmen uh, in this class, uh, very talented, and so it's just a matter of are they ready? Um, and that's, that's we got a long time to evaluate that. We've got the entire fall, we've got spring, um, and a lot of them will improve between the fall period and then the, the beginning of the spring. So it's a long way to go. Again, as a coach, as a, as a staff, we're going to keep our eyes open. We're going to coach them hard uh, and help them continue to improve and then figure out who are the best guys uh, with the roles once we get to the spring. Um, but it's going to take strike throwers. It's going to take guys that control the running game. It's going to have guys that have out pitches. All those things matter, and so we have the next six months, seven months to, to figure all those things out. Mark, got a little more kind of on scheduling, but with Clemson, I think the four-game series for um, minor league ballparks in the upstate here ended. Do you guys have any idea about where that third game might be played? This that year? is in process, <laughs> and that is, uh, I think those decisions will be made by higher ups. Um, I think as coaches, we, we give opinions and. and say what we think the pluses and the minuses of all the different uh, avenues are uh, and venues. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think it's, it's going to be people with bigger positions than, than baseball coaches that will make those final calls. And will you guys play a scrimmage against another team during fall ball? No, we will not. Hey, Mark. I'm Madison. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Madison. Kind of following up on David, is there a strategic reason for not wanting to play? another program and just yeah. kind of playing internally this early on? Yeah, I just think, I, I just like the fact that you have a lot of guys trying to earn roles and earn spots on the team. And I just want, every day we have a chance to go out there, I want the entire roster to be participating. When you play outside competition, you only have nine guys that get to, that get to uh, play in that game, um, and you have one pitcher. And so I just, I just think, we've done both. You know, we've had, we've played NC State, we've played Georgia Tech, like UNC Wilmington. We've seen it both ways. I did see enough value in the times we did play um, outside competition in the fall, and that was just so happy to coincide with the seasons we had that we weren't quite uh, uh, happy with following the following spring. So maybe a little bit of it is a superstition, too. So who knows? Uh, but long story short, I just I like the format we had last fall where every day we just got after it against each other because more guys get to participate. Uh, Eli and Matthew came on strong last year. They're kind of your veterans, I guess, back in that rotation. What comes next for those guys that are developing, kind of going in as leaders in that pitching staff this season? Yeah, they've done a really nice job so far this fall. Um, I look at last year, and you had the, the Noah Halls, the Mahoney's, the Sanders that were kind of your older guys that, that were leading the charge in the fall. This year, I would say that those two guys, Jones and Becker, are the guys that are kind of setting the tone for, for the work ethic and, and how guys are going about their business. So. For their personal growth, I just want to see them take another step. You know, they both took nice steps last year, um, but for us to be really good, we need them to take another step in their development and, and be dominant type guys. Um, and I, for, for both of them, really, I think it's a consistency. Uh, when they're both at the top of their game, they've been dominant. 
Eli Jones has had dominant outings against really good teams. Matthew Becker has had dominant outings against really good teams. For now, uh, it's just the biggest thing for their growth is, okay, let's do that a lot more often and a lot more consistency. Back to Matt, um, have you noticed anything different about how he handles uh, his, his pitchers or, or pitch calling or training or, or whatever that really stands out to you as, as unique or something is, is an improvement that you really like? I, I just think, look, we had a really good pitching coach before. We have a really good pitching coach now. And I think it's too early to tell what are his, what are his sprites. Um, but I, knew, I, I do know I've been getting a lot of really positive reviews from our pitchers um, about you know, what they're doing, about how they're going about their business, about their daily program. Um, so I think it's too early to tell you know, what are the major strengths from that. Um, but again, he was hired because he has a tremendous reputation among college coaches, among professional scouts. And his, the stats of his pitching staffs over the years are proof of the So you know, I'm anxious just to continue to see the growth between him and our pitchers. So talking about your returners this year, um, one that we weren't so sure about, Gavin Costas, what does it mean to have him back this year and that he withdrew his name from the draft? It means a lot. It really does. Again, I think we looked at last year and we had the three guys drafted that decided to come back and, and they had such an impact on, on our success last year. And I think Gavin's going to be the same. Gavin could have been drafted uh, pretty decent. Uh, he could have moved on to the next level and be playing <coughs> baseball right now, but he wanted to come back. He wanted to have an even greater year. He wanted to leave a more lasting legacy than just the one year um, here at South Carolina. He's extremely happy here. He loves how we how we run things. He loves the growth that he's had here. So he just wasn't ready to leave. And I think that would be a great decision for him, just like it was for last year's three draft picks that all went significantly higher um, than they had before. And uh, I think it would be great for us because we're getting the best first baseman in the country. And you know, the interesting thing with Gavin is he used all summer to get in much, much better physical shape than he had been. And he looks great right now. He's swinging the bat great. Uh, his defense is much improved, and he's in such good shape now that he's actually been taking some ground balls at third base. And he's looked pretty good over there, much much better than I would have ever imagined. So he's going to provide a lot, of, a lot of different options for us. But at the end of the day, we've got a, a middle of the order hitter that hit 19 homers back playing for us. And that's what that's we Hey, Mark. Uh, this is a two-parter. With the pitch calling technology that exists now with the earpieces and the wristbands, how has that impacted or not impacted sign stealing? And where does that fit in in your priority list as far as concealing signs or trying to figure out other guys? Well, I, I think sign stealing is a part of the game. You know, when done properly, it's, it's a gamesmanship part of the game. It's, it's well within um, baseball ethics to get pitches off pitchers with a glove angle or not to get too detailed about how the different ways you can get away pitches are but certain pitchers can give away certain tells where the batters know what's coming and one of the ways in the past was also to try to decipher catchers signs when they're out at second base and most programs have tried to take advantage over that uh, of that over the years and you know, we're no different you know if you're giving away certain tells then it's well within our reach to, to try to take advantage of that. You can't do it electronically. You can't do it, you know, in, in non-ethical ways. But if it's part of the normal flow of the game, it's well within um, gamesmanship. That has been taken away some because now very few catchers are given signs because of uh, you know, the, the technology we have. Um, but yeah, number one, as a, as a defense, as a pitching staff, you want to do everything possible not to to make sure that the opponent is not taking pitches off of you and then figuring out what you're about to throw. Uh, but then offensively, it also makes a little bit of a difference because it's harder to do than it's ever been. So I think it's good for the game. It has sped up the game. And it gives you a little, it gives you one less thing to have to worry about that pitchers, you know, and, and opponents are, are getting your signs off your catcher. Back to the Mark, bringing in a guy like Joey probably moves Scott would go off the field a little bit. What's his role kind of look like for the program moving forward, and how do you see him adjust to it? Yeah, Scott's title is uh, Director of Program Development, and so we're going to try to use him uh, as much as he's willing to do with alumni relations and community involvement and things of that nature. And so, again, he's a very important part of this program. And uh, when they eliminated the volunteer uh, coach, you know, and they made it a full-time position, we decided to make that a very recruiting-heavy position. And uh, 
just felt like the best thing about <coughs> the program was, was bringing Joey in with his with his vast recruiting experience. And so uh, we wanted to keep Scott in, in, as a part of the program as much as, as we could and as much as he was willing to do. So that's kind of where we're going. With you mentioned Gavin taking a step, you bring in I mean, Petrus coming back and Cena's coming back, Tommy just coming back. How have you seen those guys improve from the last time you saw them? Do it? I mean, they all just again, I think they're all out of confident. Last year at this time, Cole was coming off a, a freshman season and really struggled. Now he's coming off a season where he was first team all SEC, you know, so he has a different air about him. He now, now knows he's one of the key pieces in this whole thing. I think Lee Croy, you can say the same thing about. All these guys, it's just I see more confidence, and again, they're by far uh, not to their physical potential yet. They all have a lot of growth they can continue uh, to experience and get better. So uh, I just want to see them. They're all working extremely hard. They've all been very good leaders for our our, uh, our new guys. I've been very pleased with how our new guys have taken in, uh, how our old guys have taken in the new guys, and, and so obviously that's something that I thought we did really really well last year, and that's been an emphasis this year to make sure that you guys come together as a team as quickly as possible. And that doesn't happen without those guys being really good leaders and setting a good example. So we're very pleased with that. One more transport question on Ty, you know, coming in from Charleston. What does he bring? What do you, what do you like about him in the portal? And what kind of role can he have on the staff next spring? Well, he was his conference pitcher of the year. So you know, again, you're getting a proven guy that's been uh, in High leverage Division One games where he's had great success. Um, what what role he carves out for himself this year is it, up to him. You know, whether it's as a starter, whether it's as a key bullpen guy, uh, that will be up to him and, and the guys around him. But uh, we love his competitiveness. Uh, he's got really good off-speed pitches. The fastball will be in that 89 to 91 range um, with a pretty good down angle. And uh, but the one thing we've heard time and time again is when the stakes get bigger, he gets better. And so. When he's playing in front of 10,000 people here at Founders, I can't wait to see him compete. Yeah. Uh, out of curiosity, y'all are starting um, fall practice at least a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks later than usual. The thought process behind that? Just number one, gives them more time to kind of get used to our new coaches and how we're doing things. Number two, for the injured guys, it gives them a little bit more time. Number three, for the guys that played summer ball. Um, we just thought giving them a little a chance to catch their breath a little bit um, would be beneficial. So because we're in the South, we have the ability to be a little bit more flexible like that. And the, the weather is warmer for longer, so we just thought it was something that we would get a shot. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Thanks.